In order to reproduce sexually, gametes, that's sex cells, must be made. This happens by meiosis, for example, in the testes to make sperm. Chromosomes in a diploid cell, that is 23 pairs for humans, are copied. Similar chromosomes then pair up and genes are swapped between them. The cell then divides to make two diploid cells, which then divide again, along with the chromosomes themselves, to make four haploid cells, ready to fuse with another gamete. This is one way that variation occurs in offspring, by the way. The resulting diploid cell then starts to divide via mitosis. Plants can also reproduce asexually. As this doesn't involve gametes, the daughter cells will be genetically identical, so a clone of the parent is made by mitosis. An advantage of sexual reproduction, of course, is that variation occurs, which can result in organisms becoming better suited to their environment, so they're more likely to survive. However, an advantage for asexual reproduction is that only one parent is needed. So, for example, if a plant is on its lonesome, it can still reproduce in order for the species to survive. Examples of other organisms that can do both are the parasite that causes malaria and some fungi. Genome is the term given to all the genetic material in an organism. This code is stored in DNA, of course, which is a two-stranded polymer in a double helix shape. A gene is a section of DNA that codes for a specific protein. The Human Genome Project completed its initial goal in 2003 when scientists mapped out what every gene is responsible for coding. This is powerful because it can help us identify what genes cause diseases or inherited disorders. Genotype is the term given to what specific code is stored in an organism, while phenotype is how that code is expressed in your characteristics, what proteins are made and that affects your physiology. The monomers between two strands of DNA are called nucleotides, and they're made from a sugar and phosphate group. There are four types, A, T, C, and G. You don't need to know what the names are, but A and T always go together in the sequence, as do C and G. Every three of these bases, as we call them, are a code for an amino acid. The sequence is copied by mRNA. This copy is then taken out of the nucleus to a ribosome in the cell where amino acids are connected in the order needed, which makes a protein, the shape of which affects its function. They also need to be folded into the right shape as well. Harmful mutations can change a gene so much that it results in a protein being synthesized that doesn't do the job it's supposed to. We now know that some DNA, however, doesn't directly code for proteins, but influences how other genes are expressed. This is the realm of epigenetics, and it's completely changing the way that we view DNA. Some characteristics are controlled by just one gene, like color blindness. These different types of the same gene are called alleles. Usually, characteristics are dependent on two or more genes and how they interact. But keeping things simple, Dominant alleles are those that result in a characteristic being expressed, even if there's another allele present, a recessive allele we say. If you have the alleles big B, little b for eye colour, big B being brown, little b being blue, you will have brown eyes. It's only when there's no dominant allele in this case that the recessive allele is expressed. So me having blue eyes, I must have the gene little b, little b. Big B, Big B, or Little B, Little B are homozygous genes, as they only have one type of allele, whereas Big B, Little B is what we call heterozygous. We can use a Punnett square to predict the probability of a certain phenotype. My parents have brown eyes, but they both have heterozygous alleles for eye colour. There are three different outcomes of these combining, with a 25% chance of making me. That's Little B, Little B, so I'm not so much one in a million, more one in four. Eye colour is by the by, but some alleles can result in disorders being inherited. For example, polydactyly, extra fingers or toes, is caused by a dominant allele, while cystic fibrosis is caused by a recessive allele. Even if two parents don't have cystic fibrosis, they could still be carrying the recessive allele, so their child could have the disorder. Human DNA contains 23 pairs of chromosomes, but only one pair of these determines sex. If you have XX chromosomes, you are female. If you have XY chromosomes, you're male. The expression of these genes affects every cell in your body, every aspect of your physiology. We can also make a Punnett square to show this. As you can see, there's a 50-50 chance of a child being male or female. Variation is a result of the genes inherited from an organism's parents and also environmental factors. Charles Darwin's theory of evolution claims that random variation in offspring will result in some being better suited to their environment than others, and so are more likely to survive and reproduce. 
Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, however, asserted that adaptation and variation is guided by DNA in response to a changing environment. This was scoffed at for a long time, but we now know there's some truth to this, thanks to the discoveries made in epigenetics like we mentioned. Bacterial resistance to antibiotics is largely considered to be evidence of Darwinian evolution. Bacteria divide, mutations occur, and inevitably a bacterium with an increased resistance will be produced. That's why we only want to use antibiotics when absolutely necessary. It also means you have to complete the whole course of antibiotics. If you don't, weaker bacteria will be killed off, but more resistant ones will still be there, and then they're able to reproduce and make you even more ill. If organisms are able to produce fertile offspring, we say they're of the same species. Tigers and lions have been known to make liger offspring, but as they're infertile, we don't consider tigers and lions to be of the same species. We can selectively breed living things with desired characteristics to enhance these. For example, breeding dogs to produce breeds like Labradors, Collies, and if you're into undesirable characteristics, pugs too. Advancements in biology mean that we can also genetically modify organisms if we don't want to wait for selective breeding to do the job, or when we can't actually achieve what we want to with it for good or ill. For example, scientists have genetically modified bacteria to produce insulin, which can be harvested and used to treat people with diabetes. Genetically modifying crops is the way of boosting their yields or nutritional value. For example, golden rice has a gene inserted into it that produces vitamin A. It was developed to combat diets in certain areas that were lacking in this vitamin. Other GM crops have been modified to be more resistant to diseases, for example. The process of genetic engineering goes as follows. A gene is chemically cut from the organism that has the desired characteristic. This is done using enzymes, for example, the gene from a jellyfish that causes it to glow in the dark. This is then inserted into a vector, like a bacterial plasmid or virus that, in turn, inserts the gene into another organism, say a bunny rabbit. But this must be done in the very early stages of its development, say just after the egg has been fertilised, as this is the only way that you can be sure that the gene will be present in every cell of the bunny as it grows. By the way, I didn't make up this example, this has actually been done. Fossils are the remains of organisms that died a very long time ago. The classic fossils we think about are the bones that we dig up, but they're not strictly speaking bones anymore. In fact, minerals have replaced the organic material to effectively leave rocks in the shape of the bones. Sometimes there can still be organic tissue left behind if the conditions for decay are not present. Footprints left in mud that have hardened over time, for example, are also considered fossils, as well as any other trace of an organism. It doesn't have to be the organism itself. Making exact copies of plants is easy. Just take cuttings off a plant, plop them in the ground, and that does the job. You can also go the slightly harder route by cloning from a tissue culture. This can be helpful for preserving some species from going extinct. Cloning animals is more difficult, however. One way is splitting embryo cells up just after fertilisation, then putting them into surrogate mothers. Essentially, you're forcing identical twins, but you don't know exactly what you're getting until they're developed. If you have a fully grown animal that you want to clone, take the nucleus from one of its cells, say in its skin, then insert that into another egg cell. It's essentially now a fertilised egg. Shocking the egg jumpstarts the development process and it starts to divide. It's then inserted into another female's womb where it continues to develop. So I hope you found that helpful. Leave a like and a comment if you did. and Click on the card to take you to the playlist for all of the papers. And don't forget to check out the Science Shorts app to help you test your knowledge.